Good afternoon, viewers. Um, you are watching us on Exchange for Media's Martech Fridays, where we are going to discuss today, this lovely afternoon, uh, the role technologies uh, have played and are playing in boosting uh, customer engagement. Uh, this is essentially mar marketing technologies that have been deployed as tool sets to harness the customer feedback and improve a customer experience. This is the topic for discussion this Friday. And with me, uh, we have a very esteemed panel, but before I ask the panel to introduce um, uh, themselves, let me all welcome you from uh, the, those who are logging in uh, at Zoom, logging in from Facebook Live, from LinkedIn, from Twitter, uh, you know, you're most welcome. And I hope you will have a fruitful discussion. Um, we have, as I said, a very um, esteemed uh, panel from diverse background. And I would ask uh, all of them to introduce themselves. And post that, I will lay out the broad spectrum of what we are going to cover today. Uh, and then we will have a freewheeling discussion. Uh, may I now ask Mukul to, uh, you know, since you are, I'm seeing you at the top, on the top left on my screen, yeah, may I ask okay. you to uh, begin by introducing yourself. Sure, and sure. we'll go it uh, clockwise with Mukul, then Ashish, Bharat, Shweta, and Janak. Mukul, sure. over to you. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Mukul Kumar Sharma. Uh, I am the CEO of Pink Villa. We have one of the largest entertainment sites globally doing over 30 million unique visitors per month. Uh, I've been with Pink Villa for the last five years, uh, before which I've been with uh, companies like Koimoi.com, games to win prior to which I was with radio for a while. I was working with a channel called Radio One. Uh, so uh, great to have joined this discussion and uh, I hope it will be a very fruitful session. Thanks uh, Mukul. Ashish. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. I am Ashish. I head e-commerce for Godrej and Boys. Uh, from past three years, I'm trying to actually build an omni-channel commerce business for Godrej and Boys. Prior to that, I was uh, head of online grocery for Reliance Retail. So what you see as a GeoMart today, I think something which we started in 2012. And for almost four years, I was developing that. And in the last assignment, I was joint business head for uh, that uh, initiative. Of course, uh, almost 17 years I spent with uh, Reliance. It was more actually in telecom, in retail. And when I joined, actually, the, one of the biggest initiative was the Reliance Petroleum Refinery in Jamnagar, which was Asia's biggest. And I started career from there. Well, that's a fascinating um, career, Ashish. Now we come to one of our youngest members, Bharat. Tell us about Rich Coffee and yourself. Hi, it's a pleasure to be here talking to each one of you and all the viewers watching. I'm a serial entrepreneur. I am young, but I also started very young. Uh, I started my first company, I was still in um, school. It was something on the side, but it taught me a lot about entrepreneurship. Uh, at 21, I started a company uh, called Postagali back in 2011. Um, it was a direct to consumer brand ahead of its time. Uh, internet and e commerce was just starting to kind of penetrate the Indian market. And the company grew from zero to something substantially big in four years. I exited the company uh, in 2016 and then started a company in a B2B e-commerce space. Um, so happy to talk a lot about how uh, kind of technology is changing uh, customer engagement and how do you really take uh, your customer experience to the next level because of the uh, possibilities of internet being around. And I currently run an FMCG company called Rage Coffee, uh, which I started in 2018. Uh, the goal was to build a 500 crore company online digitally native, um, you know, that would be direct to consumer and also um, the distribution channel would be very different, but it would be largely be direct to consumer. So again, how can customer experience be a moat and actually defensibility for your business is what I can talk about. Fantastic. I think we are in for a, a very exciting and enriching uh, you know, session with you in there. And over to Shweta now. Hey, hi, everyone. Uh, 
thanks thanks for the uh, you know kind of starting the introduction there sanjay uh, i am actually a digital evangelist and the kind of consider myself a torch bearer of digital because i've been associated with the industry since 2000 and since then i've been a part of uh, almost all the stakeholders who are there in the ecosystem be it the media or the agencies or client side dot com so on so i feel fortunate about being a part of this industry for quite some time now and currently leading a, a digital for kids uh, looking forward to a, a fantastic discussion that we'll have with with an amazing panel that we have and with you sanjay thanks thank you shweta um over to janak hi uh, i am janak sarda i lead the desh truth group of newspapers and media house uh, i am a media and a tech enthusiast hence uh marketing is a subject closer to my heart or dear to me i would say uh after having run the media business for about over 10 12 to 15 years i started a startup in the machine learning and artificial intelligence space and uh, we cater to the healthcare the hospitality by way of bots bots that something you and i probably use on a daily basis these days uh alexas are going to command the way we behave in our uh homes or offices and uh, of course a lot of interaction going forward with the technology space completely for all uh, spectrums of media and advertising thank you thank you janak i think uh, we are in for really a fascinating conversation given your expertise in machine learning and your experience of having applied that in your businesses so thank you very much so uh, dear audience you can you can see that uh, we have a very diverse set of um, you know panelist uh, each of them being an expert in their field of um, uh, you know expertise and before we begin our conversation let me share with you what are the broad uh, areas that we're going to cover um we're going to talk about the last quarter you know how the quarter 1 of the financial year 2021 has been for everybody in terms of the customer level have you seen any dip in your customer engagement or as we've seen in the media uh, industry um we had a paradox while the ad revenue dipped and the cpms dipped but the customer engagement actually uh, went up the roof so what has been the level of customer engagement uh, for you uh, during this quarter um did you put in any strategy to bolster customer engagement or you reacted to the situation or maybe you innovated on your feet what is it that you did to to counter uh, this unprecedented situation that um, we were put in um uh did you deploy any specific tools of technology or did you apply common sense as simple as uh, that and if we have to talk about the tools of technology um i would like to talk about the role of artificial intelligence uh, machine learning virtual reality chatbots big data uh, you know and how all this has led us to boosting the customer engagement specifically on the diversity of platforms mobile being the highlight that would be one of our key conversation points um what about personalization you know how did you achieve better sharper um more um, intrinsic one to one kind of personalization um did you use 360 degree to go for omni channel interactions how did you harness the social signals what was your conversation with your social community uh, because community is the key to engagement and of course um if you have to think on your feet you have to think out of the box how did you enable real time or quick decision making in your organization to respond to the customer needs because all this makes for a superior customer experience so these are the things that we're going to talk about i am also going to talk about given the topic that we have today which is essentially the role of technologies enhancing customer satisfaction i'm going to leave a question with you i recently read an article by the harvard business review where they talked about the need of cmo to actually move to the role of cmp and they called it as a chief marketing technologist you know so is there a time now is it an opportune time for cmos 
to be morphed into CMTs, where most of the decisions that they're going to make are going to be driven by technology. Um, and uh, HBR in his incisive article talked about how uh, the CMT's role is essentially to align the marketing technology requirement of the company uh, with uh, and align that to the business goals. So I, I would like to discuss that. We would also talk about some specific case studies that you may have in mind, either of your own company or of the ecosystem at large. And then we will uh, cover the challenges that you face in terms of deployment of the marketing technologies. The challenges in terms of uh, logistical execution versus the uh, a very tricky challenge of the fine line that you need to draw between data privacy and uh, you know uh, harnessing the social footprint. Uh, because as corporates, you need to play a responsible role. And I like to hear what we did. Finally, and hopefully we should be able to cover all this uh, in the next one hour that we have. Uh, I would like you to do a little bit of crystal ball gazing. You know. Uh, how does the future look like? We've come out of a difficult quarter. This quarter presented tremendous challenges, but as we've seen, human resilience is triumphing and most of us have been able to convert these challenges into opportunities. And the first quarter results of the IT industry that we've seen in this country are very heartwarming indeed. So with this as backdrop, let me begin. And I think, let me begin by asking the first question to let's say Shweta, because Shweta is, is handling um, the digital portfolio for Philips as a brand, a range covers from both consumer durables to healthcare. Um, uh, Shweta, tell us, give me your opening thoughts about um, the customer engagement levels. H how, how did the graph initially look to you and how is it shaping up today? Sure, so thanks Sanjay. Uh, so I believe that customer engagement uh, you know, I will consider two types of customer engagement. So one is the organic engagement, which may happen because of this COVID-19 situation and the, you know, post scenarios. And the other one is the triggered customer engagement where you realize there is an opportunity, but you had to trigger it because it didn't come organically. So if you talk about the healthcare business, definitely there was an organic engagement uh, because of the very nature of the businesses. Uh, but there are some consumer businesses where uh, the, the company had to trigger it because uh, you need it to engage with your customer in the situation where there is an opportunity because they are spending more than 25% time uh, post-COVID. You know, we have seen like 25 to 30% increase in the amount of time that people were spending online. So that was an opportunity, right? So that was the trigger kind of customer engagement. So one was which happened automatically. And second is wherein we have triggered it because we, we thought that there's a need and we have to be in touch with the customer in this situation, uh, despite of the, you know, the pandemic uh, uh, scenario there. So I guess these are the two kind of, we have seen this engagement uh, going pretty high in case of healthcare because, uh, because of the various, you know, product portfolios that we have. Uh, talking about, you know, uh, ventilators and maybe respiratory devices and all those things. And also we got this opportunity to engage with the customers and doctors and physicians who had a lot of time at this moment, unlike the pre-COVID scenario, uh, you know, to engage with them and then kind of, you know, have a conversation through various webinars, virtual sessions, uh, and, you know, be in constant touch. So this is how it has impacted. All right. I think interesting point you've made about triggering the engagement. And I think that is a very, very proactive approach to doing business. Uh, Mukul, I know Pink Villa's consumption of entertainment content, you know, actually hit through the roof, uh, you know, because everybody was at home and uh, everybody was watching <laughs> entertainment and Bollywood right. and stuff like that. Uh, but did you experience initially some jitters in the beginning? Just yeah. take us through your... Yeah. yeah, sure. So, uh... I think when the lockdown started and everything, we experienced a lot of jitters, honestly, because uh, see, we heavily rely on content uh, in terms of video content and also textual content. So what happened initially is though consumers were spending more time online, there was a dearth of content. So which is why what we witnessed is a lot of sites witnessed a heavy growth in their traffic, but they were primarily hard news, traditional news sites. We did not see any drop, but we did not see any spike. This I'm talking about the first uh, couple of weeks uh, when the lockdown was first announced. 
Then, however, uh, we figured out uh, a strategy to uh, bend around it. And we, what we did is uh, innovate on content. So we, we don't just do Bollywood. We also do a lot of lifestyle, fashion, beauty. Uh, now, fashion, beauty, Bollywood was pretty much restrictive um, in terms of what you can do uh, or whether people are interested in that in this scenario. So what we did more of was on health, which worked really well. Uh, so it was changing. Like the first few weeks, there were videos around coronavirus awareness, how you can take care of your health, how you can boost your immunity and a bunch of other things, uh, which worked really well. Then there was a different set of content pieces, which worked really well. So I would say we really changed the way we were looking at content. Uh, all these decisions were obviously based on data, uh, on social listening tools, on our in-house uh, analytics tools, on user behavior, and what users were reacting to what in terms of even Google trends and everything. Uh, but we had to really innovate in terms of the way we were doing content and what we were covering and what we were not. Uh, but I would say we could do it very successfully uh, basis the data and how consumers were reacting to it. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, you know, that actually leads me to a question to Ashish. Uh, as, assuming Ashish that, you know, you had initially experienced dip and then maybe hopefully, uh, you know, uh, uh, hopefully you bounce back, but you're in a business which is about Godrej interiors, essentially furniture. And initially for the first two months, everything was locked up. Now, proactively, what steps uh, did you think, did you take some steps or you were just basically hit by, a, by, by this whole uh, incident? So, uh, Sanjay, I think uh, the situation was definitely unprecedented and no one actually was knowing what to do in that scenario. And since furniture is a business which is both a discretionary also, and it requires a lot of supply chain in terms of deliveries, in terms of installation. So, when we actually went into deep that what will happen maybe in April and May, we realized that uh, there is a sudden jump in terms of people actually looking for work from home related actually content. And we have an ergonomic cell and like what uh, is like talked about. Yes. People are thinking about they're working from home, but 90% of people actually don't know how to work from home. They started feeling problem related to health. They started feeling problem related to uh, how to focus on their work. So as a brand, we have a lot of actually uh, expertise in terms of our ergonomics. And uh, so what we did actually, we started communicating with our uh, audiences two times in a day. So first in the morning, we were talking about what they can do in terms of uh, ensuring that their day goes properly. And in the evening around four or five o'clock, we were talking about very, very simple health tips. So maybe just an exercise which they can do in for 10 seconds, 20 seconds. We saw actually the engagement was huge. There is a huge increase in terms of engagement. So once we realized, actually, we went into in depth and understand what exactly is happening in the market, rather than actually thinking about what actually can I can do to increase my sale. So for first two months, almost we invested our time in terms of understanding pain points and other things. And subsequently, we built actually a strategy of how to cater to this new demand, as well as help customer in this hour of need. So I think like consumption of content increases, consumption of uh, you see, brand engagement actually increases almost 3x times. Mm -hmm. But of course, sales in the quarter one as well as in the quarter one, it, Q2, it will take some time actually to go back to the normal level. But yeah. we are actually seeing a lot of good growth actually, starting like from say April to maybe now July scenario. So I think yeah. pretty much good trajectory actually. Good. And I think uh, later on when people started working from home, the sale of ergonomic furniture and chairs definitely, you know, would have shot up. And you guys had some very sleek uh, furniture in that uh, domain. Let me now uh, take this question to Bharat. Bharat, you essentially with your new business, which is I think the third venture that you're launching in your extremely young life, and may you continue to scale greater heights. Uh, with coffee as a business and that too, in a, in a brick and mortar space coffee, you're not selling virtual coffee. Uh, you know, um, what has your experience been and how did you adapt to this unprecedented situation? Sure, sure. So um, first to clarify, we are a CPG company. We are a packaged coffee company. We do not run any food service, any QSR, any Horeca, nothing. 
Okay. Uh, we do have institutional businesses. Uh, we do supply to a lot of Horeca, but we ourselves do not own any brick and mortar. Uh, it's not a part of our uh, near short term uh, or mid term plans. Business also. to business company. Uh, it's a no. It's a it's a B two C company and B two B company in the way that we basically manufacture uh, and distribute and market very innovative coffee products uh, yeah. to the Indian audience online. Uh, right. We do have offline presence as well, but we are largely a digitally native brand. We, when I say digitally native, I mean that we are digitally first. Uh, we think about our customers, we think about the products, we think about marketing and advertising and customer acquisition in a very digital way. Uh, so largely the, the DNA of the company is direct to consumer. Mm-hmm. Um, and the possibilities that direct to consumer presents, I think I can touch upon those, but uh, you know, if we, if we kind of broaden the scenario here and we look at, uh, you know, what's been happening, at least in the last, uh, you know, one quarter since COVID has hit us all, I think April was uh, tough. Uh, April, April was, tough. I think, almost almost blank for almost most businesses that we've spoken to. But we have seen a continuous recovery. Uh, we've seen, a, in fact, uh, you know, I can also disclose that June was the best month ever for us in our business. Uh, because, because uh, you know, there are two, three things, but largely our biggest competition coffee shops are shut uh, or, you know, people are not willing to go there right now um, because of all the other reasons. But, but the uh, biggest factor, I think, have also been that at-home consumption of uh, food products and grocery products has kind of increased. Uh, also, we were very, I would say, well set up uh, to fight this kind of a change. Because if you look, you know, you mentioned about Omni Channel. We are, I would say, uh, you know, from birth we are Omni Channel. We are not, you know, legacy giant now trying to go Omni Channel so that we have to think and move all pieces of a puzzle in an Omni Channel thinking. But we think from day zero, we think about Omni Channel. We think about how we need to go to our customer, how we need to approach our customers. So we were very well set up for this kind of a change because uh, for us, when the consumers wanted us, you know, online, we were available in all platforms. We were available direct to consumer or through our own websites. Um, and beyond that, I think we just have such a close communication with our customers throughout their journey of, you know, throughout the life cycle of purchase and repeats that uh, we were, we became a, you know, almost, almost a go-to choice for them. All the kind of brands that are even close to our, uh, you know, two or three brands that, are even close to the quality that we give the, uh, you know, the product range that we have, they're all being imported into India and they were also hit. So these two or three reasons, I think, were a mix of why we are seeing a surge and why I think we will continue to see a surge also with now Make in India, the entire uh, conscious that the Indian consumer has, got, you know, gathered in the last one or two months has been phenomenal. It is such a big boon for Indian entrepreneurs, I feel. And that could not have come if the consumers didn't start to think like that. So I'm very happy about that as well because we are make made in India product and we're very proud to be able to give something at an affordable cost to consumers, which are all being, which was all earlier being imported into India. Fantastic. In fact, uh, your passion is clearly coming across Bharat and, and coffee in these troubled times is also uh, a bit of a stress reliever. So, you know, I'm yes, sure yes. besides initially that you may have faced some logistical challenges in terms of uh, delivery, but I'm sure uh, you're in for a good time. Now, let me ask Janak, we've, we've discussed um, the broad spectrum of consumer engagement levels. Initially, most of you found it uh, dipping a little bit, but you bounced back, you thought on your feet, you triggered consumer responses, you innovated, you know, you made your product uh, digitally, digitally savvy and digitally native, you embraced the 360 degrees concept. But to do all this, Janak, um, what are the tools which are best suited from a technological perspective to be deployed? And I'm not necessarily asking about one specific tool, which is essentially data crunching, uh, machine learning. But uh, in your experience, uh, what are the best marketing technology tools that are available for marketers to actually um, deploy in this kind of a scenario and going forward? Uh, well, I think uh, what is clearly, uh, you know, written on the wall is that we need to start embracing technology and make it mainstream. Uh, we need to bring it into our DNA uh, as marketeers and uh, 
kind of think of our brand's vision on embracing it and going to market with those strategies. Essentially, what we noticed was uh, the hype cycle was terrific uh, at the beginning uh, of the COVID season. It continues to remain like that. However, having said that, uh, distribution channels, distribution uh, challenges that every product or every marketer faced were quite unique. But the customer engagement uh, initiatives that they needed to launch during the, these times to, uh, came as a teaching of sorts. You know, you need to be now better equipped, better prepared to face a situation like this than ever before in the future. This is not a temporary crisis that can be resolved through PR. It is hmm. going to be a long lasting impact that your brands are going to face and you're going to need to use technology smartly to start communicating. So much so that uh, one of the biggest advertisers globally is now uh, kind of deploying a bot permanent. We are working on one of those uh, you know, bots and we are helping them kind of visualize on what is the kind of communication that they need to have with their consumers, not just during crisis like this, but even otherwise, because it's an expectation. Something that is available off the shelf need not need so much of tech uh, backing as such, but you have to think like that. I think the time has come. In fact, for us in the news media as well, uh, that was something that we needed to kind of shift to overnight. Mm -hmm. While in seven days, the print editions uh, kind of came on for us in some parts of Maharashtra in a staggered manner, our flagship editions were still curtailed to digital, you know? So all of a sudden I had to push my newsroom to kind of think only digital embrace work from home because we are used to coming to offices, making calls in the evening, maintaining deadlines for the print, etc. But now that's not the norm. The new norm is you need to be better prepared, better equipped to go to your reader, consumer uh, and the market as such. Yeah. So I believe uh, it's time that the CMOs uh, start also thinking of their roles to be uh, the kind of, uh, you know, uh, you know, that you use. Uh, <laughs> I would say from CMTs from CMOs. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I think you know, Howard has been able to actually predict trends. And, but, you know, we, this is a larger question. And that is, I think, a subject matter of another session. Because marketing and advertising um, is both a mix of science and art. And if you purely take the, you know, the, the approach, which is scientific, you will miss out on the creation of big ideas. You know, advertising thrives on human ingenuity and, and you can't only be data crunching. So I think hybrid models have to uh, evolve and, and we have to, perhaps that's a subject for discussion on another day. Um, you talked about chatbots and in my experience, uh, I often find chatbots uh, very um, uh, impersonal. They, they cannot be customized. And sometimes with my experience of chatbots has been that it has been very frustrated and I wanted to get in touch with the customer service representative, especially when it comes to e-commerce. So there are limitations, but then technologies are constantly evolving. Uh, Mukul, my question to you is about one way we've seen that superior customer experience, hence better customer engagement can be created if you are able to look at personalization. Uh, you know, and personalization on specifically um, mobile platform. Share with us your experience of Pink Villa because Pink Villa's content consumption, I presume, I mean, share with us hum, hum, what percent of your, uh, percentage of your content is consumed on mobile. I would guess it's around 90%, but but share uh, with us. Uh, 96, 97%. Yeah. I, oh my God. I guess desktop is about a cup, one or 2%. Uh, the remaining is tablet and about 96, 97% is mobile. I think that's the trend with all the publishers, not just us. Uh, the world has moved uh, mobile. Um, see, in terms of personalization, what we've been doing is uh, uh, because previously what would happen is uh, you have a homepage. How publishers work is you feature everything on the homepage and people yeah. can take a pick. But when we are doing like close to 300 articles in a day, it's not possible to feature 300 articles on the homepage. So then what do you do? You, uh, some people came up with the solution where, you know, you have different landing pages for different geos in terms of geo targeting. But now what the publisher space is moving towards is personalization in terms of first, 
tracking what the user is interested in. Like I said, we do various categories like fashion, beauty, lifestyle. Then even in the film industry, right? We cover a lot of Korean. Now that's the new hot thing in the teenage world. A lot of K-pop is being consumed uh, a lot. K-pop. Yeah, K-pop. And that's something we discovered recently in the last three, four months. Uh, it has crazy fan following. You have no idea what level. I mean, Shah Rukh Khan is nobody in front of them. That is the level of global fan following they have. Uh, no offense to Shah Rukh, of course, <laughs> but yeah, I'm just explaining the scale. So what typically happens is uh, what we're doing now is we are making buckets in terms of which users are interested in which type of content more. We are bucketing them. Um, and then we are repurposing those buckets to retarget the users with such kind of content. Now, what are we using to retarget? Uh, dynamic pages in terms of every user sees a very unique and customized landing page. That is one. Uh, in terms of newsletters, we are trying to automate that as well. So whoever's interested in whatever type of content gets those specific type of content pieces. In addition to that, what we are doing is we are trying to engage those users. So like to continue on the example of K-pop, every article that we do on K-pop has at least like 2000, 3000, some even have 10,000 comments. And these comments are on the website. So we discovered new content for maths that we want to do and target specific to categories to drive engagements. And these are all native comments. So they are not like, I'm not talking about social. We have a huge following on social as well, but this I'm just talking natively on the site. So I think one of the most important things was uh, to first figure out uh, what the users want and which section of users want what and then bucket them and target them accordingly. So that is something we are working very extensively on in terms of Firebase and BigQuery and a bunch of other technologies. And we expect to improve further targeting basis that and increase even more user engagement. Fascinating. Uh, Ashish, in terms of deployment of technology, you know, you initially talked about striking up a twice a day conversation with your consumers, you know, a structured conversation with your consumer. Um, but behind the scenes to, to data mine, uh, to, to narrow uh, down to your specifics of the audience sets, uh, what are the kind of technologies that you used? Or was it entirely an applied technology game? Look, I think most of the technologies which are rightly available in, in in the current scenario, I mean, you talk about the utilization of the search trends, dynamic marketing and all those sort of things. From a commerce perspective, I think even if you really think from a conversion mm -hmm. perspective, I think these are the technologies which are giving results. So if I talk about uh, personalization and we have deployed a couple of such solutions, like we have actually put the complete emphasis on uh, uh, response from our chatbots. Earlier it used to be one of the thing, but now it is actually something which is driving when people are asking for deliveries, people are asking for services. So this is at the customer experience front. But if you talk about from a demand perspective, right, these are the yeah. discretionary demands. So which I think got affected so much in the past one quarter and four months, certain technologies like personalization, customization at a scale, which we were earlier also doing were like little bit not giving result because the context has changed completely. So if I really think from a perspective now, people are buying chairs and uh, tables more as compared to say maybe beds. Hmm. I think the whole shift in this past four months have actually taken like caught us unaware in terms of this whole efforts on personalization and customization. Mm -hmm. but I, think I want to just talk about in terms of furniture industry and more so from a tech perspective. Mm -hmm. There are only two queries if you really think from a customer uh, perspective, if they want to have buy a furniture, one mm -hmm. is actually how this furniture will go with their surroundings, the colors and other things. And second, yes. will it fit or not? So mm -hmm. I think AR is one technology on which we are working uh, extensively and we are trying to find a solution there. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, the color and other combinations still are like, uh, it's a very, very personalized choice and we are not able to find answer till now with a lot of our data. But mm. AR is something where we are actually bullish about and mm. probably you will see a lot of things actually happening on our website in that area. Fantastic. In fact, so you talked about one specific tool sets of technologies that you're currently using and going to be deploying more aggressively, which is augmented reality and virtual reality and yes. how you're going to create customer walkthroughs and fitments and all that. Uh, Bharat, in your experience, um, you know, um, since 
Uh, you clarified that you're essentially a digital native product. Um, what is the kind of technological outreach uh, that you think is most suitable for your kind of brand for the customer outreach and engagement, both? So outreach to begin with and then engagement. So uh, for us, I think uh, there is a broad playbook that uh, businesses you know, like ours typically follow. Uh, when it comes to outreach, I think social media is the top priority these days. Uh, and within social media channels, depending on your TG, it could be Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, uh, and other, you know, other micro kind of uh, platforms that do exist. But overall, I think social is a very critical channel for outreach. Uh, beyond social, I think, uh, you know, for acquisition, you're looking at, uh, you know, the general uh, channels that a lot of marketers have used over the years, but if the, the channels have evolved over time, you know, be it email marketing, be it SMS campaigns that you do, uh, be it Google, be it SEO, uh, that, you know, that is important. Um, but so, so these are the things that are really important because see, uh, digital customers, where are they coming from to find about you? They're either searching for your product or they, I just see the product when they are on, you know, somewhere natively. They are on, let's say, on a news website, and they see your product. A lot of that uh, heavy lifting is done by these giants for you. Mm -hmm. so for example, Google will do a lot of remarketing, retargeting for you. If you do, do it right. Another right. interesting thing that has worked for us, worked for us, is uh, programmatic. So you really hyper local kind of target, and there are various other things that advertising can push uh, that for you at the right stage. So that's about outreach, and uh, you know. Another thing is within social media, there's a lot of kind of content you can do. Um, videos is hot, for example. Every brand has to figure out what works for them. And uh, if they figure that out, they should kind of push the pedal and accelerate growth on one, of, one two or three of those kind of channels. Um, but if you look at the customer journey, when the customer gets acquired, I think that, that is when the chal challenge kind of really begins. How do you retain that customer? Uh, you know, and then again, social media plays a huge role. Uh, but beyond that, it's, it's the brand's visibility. Uh, you know, are you sending them emails? Do you have a close connection with your customers? Are you sending them feedback forms? Uh, you know, do you have some, for example, chat and messaging, right? What kind of a customer experience are you giving them? Uh, you know, if they are able, if they want to talk to you, do they have to fill up and form or do they have to go the traditional way of emailing you or can they do it in a second uh, very quickly and can they, get a, can they get a reply within the next six hours? Um, can they, can then holistically, can you plug all of this universe of social media, email, chat bots and uh, Google ads and, you know, Instagram DMs and all of this, can you then put all of this together and build a cohesive kind of universe for your customers and, um, and that I think is the really big challenge and retention is something that, uh, has, ha, is, takes, takes the cake here. I think it's, it's the most difficult thing. Uh, we see here, you know, retention, we see repeats as high as about 35%. So we know what we're doing is working. Um, then content can be plugged into several other ways. It could be video content, which really works for us. It could be, uh, static content. It could, you know, I missed the, missed the point on influencer marketing, which is very important for us as well for yeah. brand awareness. But yeah, I could go on and on the, <laughs> the various other, you know, well, kind you, of uh, you channels. You actually covered it very well. It's a very comprehensive overview of uh, what works yes. and what doesn't work. Uh, incidentally, you know what, as a student of the internet, I've been observing is that in this current times, uh, two paradoxical trends in terms of marketing have actually uh, come out there. They're at both ends of the spectrum. Um, as you know, email marketing has actually come back with the bank and we are seeing, uh, you know, emails coming back and more personalized emails uh, with much open rates, much higher open rates and customer engagement rates. Podcast has come back, uh, you know, right from New York Times to some other publishers. Uh, podcast has come back. At the other end of the spectrum is the deployment of machine learning and artificial intelligence. So these are two broad spectrums of technological yeah, interventions. Yeah. But you know, Sanjay, yeah. the thing is, the thing is a lot of companies, a lot of organizations, even really, really large organizations, they have to realize 
And I'm sure they know this, but you know, the way we look at it is that we really don't need to reinvent the wheel when it comes to marketing technologies. There is so much out there that is happening. And let these guys who really know AI, who really know ML, who really know how to build all of these bots, let them do it. If we have to, you know, customize something for ourselves, it's always there. But we typically, you know, uh, we see that when we work with these organizations, especially SaaS companies uh, that are global and are building global kind of products, either from India or, you know, selling to India, we see that uh, there's a lot of value and the ROIs are very, very high on those technologies. So we would rather just plug them in and, you know, uh, get, 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 get on with it. Yes, absolutely. Totally understandable. Uh, Janak, in terms of specific technologies, marketing technologies, uh, you know, we, as you said, we, we looked at the complete spectrum. Um, where do you see the challenges in terms of deployment? You know, uh, I'm not just talking of the skill sets alone, uh, but do you see other t t challenges in terms of adaptability of the, uh, of the, of the organization? Because you have to, you know, you do not have time these days to seed this into the organization and somehow you have to actually, um, you know, uh, pack it in the limited time that we have so that we are able to be more uh, nimble footed. So what are the kind of challenges um, that um, uh, you're facing? And I would leave uh, that thought with Shweta also to think about it, Shweta, in terms of, you know, your uh, consumer durable products and specifically your healthcare devices. Um, what has been the challenge in terms of uh, deployment, uh, reaching out, and what is it that you've discovered that you need to do better? Uh, you know. So first, let's let's uh, have Janak's views on the subject. So essentially, what we have noticed is uh, a lot of time the expectations are really high. I mean, the CMOs uh, when they start talking to us, uh, they expect the moon to be, uh, you know, literally got down to the earth and delivered tomorrow morning. Uh, with all the whims and fancies uh, that you see these days, uh, you know, the jargons that we use rather. Uh, yeah. uh, what happens is you need to realize there is a lot of back-end work that needs to go into building uh, newer sets of uh, technology deployment. Thankfully, in our space, what happens is uh, I call it the learning block for every marketeer or uh, somebody who is wanting to deploy these technologies. Like taking up from what Ashi just said about the role of bot in the Godrej ecosystem. Uh, we are talking to one of the biggest brands in the world where they want to do a bot that is a uh, lot more simpler, you know, which, which needs to blend in what their website brings to the table. Mm. So when you're talking about such kind of things, you need to kind of figure out whether your backend is ready to do this, uh, to deliver on what my framework would want to deliver or rather mm. the way you have looked at it uh, mm -hmm. as a delivery medium. A lot of times we realize that that is not ready. You know, that is not the case. So we have to work with the CTO first, try and fix up all these uh, backend issues and then go back to the brand teams or the marketing teams and kind of show showcase to them the way the process is going to work. Mm. So essentially what I am trying to get to is you need to have a clear cut defined vision on how much is the AI component or how much is the data analytic component you want to bring to the table today. Because it's a mm -hmm. gradual learning. All organizations will need to go undertake this learning exercise at some point in time. Today, tomorrow, whatever. But you need to have a vision. You need to have some uh, kind of benchmarks which are achievable, which kind of do not uh, you know, dilute the importance of embracing these technologies to your, uh, to your staff today. You know, the guys who are dealing with this today cannot get disillusioned with it. They should not be scared of it. So, there is an HR element to that as well, but mm -hmm. I believe overall the acceptance level has phenomenally increased. People do read a lot before they kind of approach or uh, come to us uh, for solutioning. Uh, data analytics, uh, artificial intelligence, I wouldn't say ML is here as yet because a lot of mm -hmm. ML, uh, the real key components of ML are not yet being deployed completely simply because yeah. again, you know, you're in the learning stage, you're in a primitive stage. Uh, so you have to have the right vision. Uh, yeah. From yeah. There. yeah, Janak, I think you've, you've hit the nail on the head. You specifically talked about the lack of organizational preparedness. You know, you talked about the multiple decision makers and too many stakeholders. And then finally, when they get it right, they want to get it overnight. So I think that is, that is the real problem. And one of the solutions which has been suggested by the pundits, and I quoted initially the Harvard Business Review, that CMOs 
have to be morphed into chief marketing technologies. My question to Shweta is, Shweta, are you ready to be the CMT? <laughs> I think I am already. So, yeah. uh, so Sanjay, I, I call this era as you know, digital Darwinism, right? Uh -huh. so, uh, so Darwin's theory, going on to that one, uh, mm -hmm. if marketers do not change or become smarter, uh, you know, it will be very difficult to sustain. So I think, I think that's something which, uh, which uh, every traditional marketer, and not just market, even organizations, right? So organizations who may not adjust with the way that the customers are evolving at this stage where they are using almost all kinds of technologies and India being a younger country, you know, you have the younger generation, Generation Z, the most, and, uh, you know, their consumer and uh, the customer behavior, their content consumption pattern, everything is so different. If the organizations do not come up uh, and they just wait and watch, uh, it will be very difficult for them, uh, specifically in this scenario, to kind of sustain. So I guess, uh, you know, marketers as well as organizations need to follow the digital Darwinism and kind of, you know, uh, uh, come up to the scale and uh, uh, the level. Uh, now, the second point which you mentioned, so I do see technology as an enabler, right? So mm -hmm. uh, it, it's all about what do you want. So it's a customer decision journey, it's a customer lifetime wherein mm -hmm. probably a technology may also be used uh, like the chatbot can be used by the customer support team because you know they need to respond to queries maybe an artificial intelligence would be or machine learning or uh, natural language processing would be required within the device itself which is more of a product innovation and not just going out and uh, the third kind of uh, technology enablement could be uh, you know leveraging programmatic or uh, you know, leveraging creative optimization, because when we are talking about digital, uh, you know, it's too complex because so many platforms. So what is working for us, probably uh, bringing in artificial intelligence at that stage, wherein mm -hmm. we can try out various creatives on the fly and the uh, performs to give the best of ROI, because ultimately, you know, as you know, many of the uh, people had mentioned that ultimately the marketer has to see the ROI and the CMO will always ask for ROI, right? So. So I think it's uh, it's important, but uh, it needs to be looked at a, at a strategic picture and not just you know one juncture. That's what I kept saying. That if you look, if you take customer as a very transactional uh, you know moment, wherein we do a transaction and we just forget about the customer, I don't think that it is going to work. So probably you need to look at the complete uh, lifetime value of that customer, and uh, and then maintain that relationship throughout. Uh, leveraging technologies, but at the end of the day, technology is an enabler. Uh, yeah. So it's not that the that the strategy is formed as per the technology, but then the technology needs to fit in the strategy and then to enable each of the departments and the vision of the company uh, to achieve whatever the organizations want to achieve. So, uh, so that's my view. And the challenge that you know I was talking about, I guess every marketer has the same challenge, specifically digital, is the pie. So what is the size of the pie in terms yeah. of investment? Uh, I, I guess if, if we show them the ROI, the pie increases. So, so that's what uh, we have been observing, uh, even with the, with the current company. And since the time I've, because I've been associated with digital for quite some time, and uh, this has been always the struggle. So, uh, yeah. I guess as in when the marketers come up to the speed, follow the digital Darwinism, I guess this pie is also going to really increase uh, and the ROI will also come. Yes. Uh, Shweta, I think this is, uh, this is wonderfully put by you, digital Darwin Darwinism, survival of the fittest. But tell me, when it comes to medical devices, and Philips is one of the largest producers of medical devices in the world, um, do you still hold true to this fact that it has to be the survival of the fittest, that there needs to be a more you know, uh, socially driven return of investment on medical devices. Get, share us with us your thoughts on medical devices and consumer engagement. So uh, I mentioned it in the beginning also. So COVID-19 to some extent for this particular business has been, uh, uh, you know, phenomenal in terms of uh, the kind of customer engagement which has started on digital, right? So we never thought about people taking so much of interest in healthcare. And now you see, you know, the content consumption on COVID-19 and on healthcare has increased a lot. So uh, it is something to do with that, uh, uh, you know, because the customers have become smarter. Uh, obviously, the trend is changing. 
uh, the devices business has always been when the B2B is always considered to be little lagging behind because B2C is more dynamic, more happening, and you know there are uh, some quick turnarounds. So uh, probably B2B is always considered as a very laid back. But I think this change has definitely, uh, you know, uh, uh, transformed, uh, you know, the whole way of looking at uh, uh, healthcare, uh, and, and even the devices at times. You know, the doctors, the limited professionals in healthcare, uh, the doctor needs to monitor various patients at the same time, looking at the vitals. And I guess that's where the connected monitors and all these devices, which have inbuilt artificial intelligence and machine learning, that comes into this thing because. Uh, the devices are connected at this sort of moment, all smart devices, uh, you know, you can actually read through all the vitals, even sitting at home. So even doctors and sons of certain patients, you know, or aging parents can actually see their, uh, you know, their uh, history as well as, you know, how they are performing, they're recovering or not. So all those things have made it more smarter and healthcare, you know, is, is one of the sector wherein uh, the data, the amount of data, which is there is huge, you know, almost thousands of exabytes. So, uh, Obviously, not all of them is usable because there are some privacy norms there. But, mm -hmm. but it's a huge segment and it's a very promising segment to, uh, to move ahead, to move forward. All right. In fact, sounds very promising and, and you've, you've put it as objectively as you could. Um, I think that brings me to the next point of our discussion, which is about the challenges in terms of deployment of MarTech, marketing technologies. And one of the things we initially, uh, I initially alluded to was a fine balance that you need to draw between, you know, uh, data privacy, the consumer data privacy, and how do you uh, harness the consumer to craft a more, you know, personalized communication to him. So uh, um, let me begin with Mukul, uh, and I would like all five of you to, you know, uh, uh, give me short answers on this one because we need to cover the last leg of our conversation, which is some amount of uh, where do we go from here. So Mukul, what are the challenges that you expect or you faced in the deployment of MarTech? So uh, like some of the problems uh, which uh, Janak brought up, right? Uh, now we are necessarily a 14 year old uh, company and when the website was built initially, uh, it was built on Drupal and still is on Drupal. What technically happens is when you have so much data and so much content, and when I'm saying data, I'm talking about our data. That is the text, the images, the links, everything. If you want to migrate it to a newer technology, uh, it will take you about two years without mm -hmm. breaking anything, obviously, mm -hmm. because, and what happens is because all the traffic we have about 70, 75% of it is organic search. So mm -hmm. that's Google news, Google discover everything and anything breaking will impact your traffic directly. And once mm -hmm. you're impacted, it'll take you six months to one year to come back. There's mm -hmm. no, no getting away the Google thing. So one of the challenges in addition to, and I think Janak touched this, but uh, it's not very easy to immediately move. It's, it's a very continuous process. It takes time, but we are slowly and steadily trying to do that with in phases because uh, while we want to adapt the latest technologies, we also want to make sure nothing breaks. That is most yeah. important. Uh, then we are compliant with all the data norms. Like if you heard of GDPR, CCPA, and the latest Brazilian one, which came out. So yeah. uh, I think a lot of countries are becoming very sensitive about that. So now yeah. in terms of data, we inform the users in for form of a pop-up, very loud pop-up, not like a very small yeah. thin ticker where we say, you know, we are collecting your data, blah, blah, oh, blah. Yeah. And, and the user has an option to opt out of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the user has an option to opt out of it and they have an option not to see personalized ads. Mm -hmm. So that, that is very good. Uh, that is a very good law, at least uh, in EU and uh, California CCPA. And now the Brazilian uh, countries are implementing it. So we, we are following all that as well. Uh, but the biggest challenge I would say is, uh, is adapting the latest technologies without breaking anything. Uh, mm -hmm. But we do try our best to keep doing it at the fastest pace possible. But we would prefer it to be way faster than what it is right now. Absolutely. I think you've, you've said it well. Ashish, um, you know, to some extent, you've been a part of a bit of a legacy organization, but which is now uh, reinventing itself at a good pace. And the Godric e-commerce is, is uh, a point uh, in time. Uh, what are the challenges that you faced from deployment of marketing, new marketing technologies in your organization. Yeah, from an organization which is actually 129 years in business, some of the systems are yeah. 30 years, 40 years. 
So one thing is system yes. change. The other thing is actually changing the uh, perception of the people also. Because look, many people in the organization are there from a long period of time. So more than actually technology, the biggest barrier is actually changing the mindset. Mm. The moment actually mindset is changed, I mm. think technology is an easy piece to solve. Mm-hmm. My view is changing the mindset first before actually you actually think about technology change. Very true. Uh, Bharat, so we've talked about organizational preparedness, lack of uh, you know, lack of organizational preparedness, the speed of execu- execution, ensuring that nothing breaks uh, in between because you're in a live business, and then the change in mindsets, uh, which is, uh, you know, Ashish also brought about this point very well. Um, would you like to add something to this? Yeah, I think, I think for us specifically, and just the way uh, businesses are adapting to digital transformation, uh, you know, the prophecies, I think it's definitely going to happen that a lot of marketing dollars are now start going to, uh, you know, these digital platforms. Um, the challenge that I see personally from a 10 year, 20 year perspective uh, is the humongous dependence, dependency on two or three different platforms. Um, as you know, internet businesses are monopolistic in nature, large internet businesses. Uh, so a heavy uh, dependency on Google, on uh, Facebook, uh, you know, I think is, is not good for the overall business because these, these companies are very fickle when it comes to their advertising uh, norms and they just really know how to gobble up any kind of money you give, want to give to them. So I think some level of uh, governance to these platforms will be needed. Um, and even Amazon, for that matter, globally, uh, you know, some level of governance to them introducing their private labels, for that matter, you know, um, you know, when they say that the Big Bazaar or Alliance does it, it's not the same, you know, because the markets are very, very different, fragmented in their case. But in your online e-commerce case, let's say globally, uh, market leader would take up all the market, mostly, yeah. uh, or, the, or the majority of the market. So I think I think some level of governance will be needed, and uh, so that these guys these guys don't have their way throughout. Yeah, corporate governance um, is is a, another good aspect you brought out, Shweta. Uh, you know, you talked about uh, initially we were we touched about privacy and data privacy, uh, and I know you're very passionate about uh, corporate social responsibility. Uh, share with us uh, how uh, the organizations can can balance their uh, you know, pecuniary or you know, the corporate interest with the social responsibility and what kind of the deployment of these technologies, which can be very pervasive, what kind of responsibilities that they impose on a corporate? Right. So uh, it's actually a very difficult question, Sanjay, and, you know, very subjective because every marketer will have, will find a different limit uh, you know, to what uh, responsibility is and you know, where all uh, we can, uh, you know, uh, draw the line. Uh, but from my perspective, I think when you think from a customer perspective, not from a technology perspective, but from a customer perspective, uh, it's easy to decide that what is good and what is bad, uh, rather than looking at what are the returns. We look uh, specifically on the returns that we are getting from customers it makes the uh, uh, thing difficult because then you are you're not at all bothered that how the, your customer feeds. Uh, second is uh, you know to understand the customer. So using these technologies to understand your customer more. Uh, typically, what we do is we have an email ID, we have a phone number. We don't know which uh, you know uh, uh, mood the customer is in, what he wants to consume, and then we start bombarding. So I guess uh, using technology more and more technology to understanding what your customer behavior is, what he wants to, whether he wants to listen to you or not, and, and making sure that you have these, uh, you know, A-B testing or, you know, various uh, uh, touch points there wherein you can set which touch point works better. So there needs to be a very, uh, you know, uh, aggr- in an aggressive manner, understanding the customer and then using technology to reach out and then, uh, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, get your objective. Uh, though it's not always possible. Now with data, with brands like, you know, ours or various of the bigger brands who have a legacy, who have a database and there are a lot of stringent rules as well, which are good, you know, in terms of recent announcements of uh, the talk, various of the Chinese players there. Uh, 
so fortunately or unfortunately, our uh, data service is out of Europe. So obviously, we have to follow the GDPR guidelines. In India, you know, they're not still not so much of stringent guidelines that we have on data privacy, which may be coming very soon, but, yeah. but not at this, uh, you know. So, so then it becomes very important for us to understand that where do we draw the line? Uh, you know, is it, uh, and, and we do have technologies to understand that whether the person has interacted with this creative, he didn't click. So that means I will not show him the creative next time when he comes. So I'll show. So there are various ways of programmatic and, you know, uh, uh, using retargeting and all those things. Uh, all the retargeting also with a frequency cap so that we don't end up, you know, showing him the ad again and again. So yeah. they need, there are available uh, options there in the technology and the software, just that yeah. marketers need to use them. So most Amazing. of them, uh, you know, most of us, we don't even use these features which are available in almost all the kind of analytics that we get. So, uh, so and, and as brands, we need to be responsible of the data that we have uh, and, you know, creating governance, that's what, uh, you know, uh, Mukul and Bharat had mentioned, so is very important. Uh, now, whether it's a corporate governance or it's, it's a, a central, uh, you know, uh, uh, governance that, you know, probably the, the government has, uh, uh, you know, communicated. I think that depends on nation yeah. to nation, but Rita, there has think, to be. Yeah, you've said it, you've encapsulated it very well. Uh, while technology and data is of extreme importance, but before everything else comes customer and customer satisfaction is the key. I'm afraid we've run out of time, but before we actually go, I would uh, exercise my uh, you know, right as a moderator to ask Janak to do a little bit of crystal ball gazing before we go, because we've already crossed our uh, allotted time. We've had a very engaging conversation. Janak, where do we go from here? Uh, just do a little bit of crystal ball gazing for us. And how do you see the MarTech uh, you know, space panning out in the next six months? Uh, so in fact, I just uh, wanted to kind of address a few issues that Bharat and Shweta just shared. We are not even talking about vision computing as yet. And we are discussing privacy. Uh, you know, all our products that we have in the market are GDPR compliant and CCPA compliant as is the norm globally because we deal with uh, global clients. But what's going to happen is the vision capability of the artificial intelligence is going to change the way we re-engage with our uh, customers from here on. Uh, what I mean to say is that camera, that security camera probably will give you a lot more insights into the age bracket, the ethnicity, the kind of a mug or a cup that a, uh, that a person was carrying while entering a mall or exiting a mall or exi uh, you know coming into the store. Look at Amazon. I think they have really kind of uh, got it out there, uh, you know, where your interaction is happening through a chatbot on customer service, but your product recognition is also being enabled through cameras. This yeah. is already happening. We need to live with this new reality. The fintech has gone ahead and kind of uh, really taken a big leap on the vision capabilities of artificial intelligence or the computer learning. That is something that I think we need to be conscious of. Yeah. But coming up today, the mainstream or the mainline consumers of tomorrow, all those kids who are 16, 17, 18 are going to behave very differently than yes. the way we address Sanjay, the way we address our generation or you know, or the kind of marketing mix that we're going to see. So there are going to be lots and lots of changes happening. We will need to be equipped and prepared to kind of embrace them. Uh, Sanjay, I believe uh, I would bet my money on uh, the vision capabilities of the computer now. Because Absolutely. I it's, think, it's yeah, you know, I think you talked about the vision computing and I think this has been fascinating. As a moderator, I would be actually amiss in my duty if I do not ask an audience question. So we, I will only take one question because we've run out of time, friends. Uh, this question is by Debanshu Banerjee and this is for Ashish. Ashish, Debanshu is asking you that, uh, do you have any roadmap at Godrej on integration of online and offline channels to start implementation so that you can have better consumer buying or better service experience? Uh, you know, um, so it, what do you have to say to that? So we are an omni-channel commerce company. We already have integration in terms of pricing, promotion, and we are integrating our channel partners also. Because look, as a brand, we have outreach more actually from our partners as compared to our direct presence. So mm -hmm. as a part of the strategy, you, he, the person can see actually maybe in three to four months time period, 
we will have our all channel partners also as part of the overall complete solution so i think from that perspective we are on that path great uh, with this i'd like to thank uh, our viewers uh, our viewers who are watching us from all parts of the country uh, hopefully from different parts of the world too thank you viewers for standing by and and uh, listening to us watching us thank you my panelists for a very engaging uh, conversation we've crossed 65 minutes and we didn't have a moment to pause so i'm really grateful for your enriching insights thanks everybody and we we'll look forward uh, to seeing you on any other, on uh, another day thanks for watching thank you thank, thank you sanjay thank you thanks a lot thank you everyone